Welcome, everybody, to this uh, panel, which is about what I think everybody in the room would agree might be the world's scariest near-term, and maybe not just near-term, problem uh, when we talk about food. Every, every issue that's being discussed here at the forum runs through this issue, whether it's climate or war in Europe or inflation or the comeback from COVID or disruption of globalization. And so we have an incredible panel here. And I want to just say, I think we should go down the line and hear from each person. What do they think? Which one of those a range of issues is the most important near-term issue in food. I'm David Rhodes. I'm the group director of Sky, uh, based in London. Uh, Sky is the European division now of Comcast, uh, the American uh, media and telecom conglomerate. I'm a 2013 class of the Young Global Leader Program for the Forum and here with the International Media Council. We have uh, Raj Shah, who I've known since you were in the Obama administration, now president of, the, of Rockefeller. It's good, to, good to have you with us. Claire Akamanzi, CEO of the Rwanda Development Board. Welcome. Uh, Hanukkah Faber, we have uh, found we have a couple of things in common. She is a division president of Unilever. Uh, and Theo De Jaeger, the president of the World Farmers, uh, Farmers Organization. So welcome. We've got multiple continents, multiple perspectives represented. Why don't we go down the line of all those things that we're concerned with right now, just in a, in a, in a few words, what is, the most, what is the most pressing? What's the worst problem for food right now? Well, maybe I'll, uh, you want me to start? I'll start with a number, which is 48. And in 2007, 8, and 9, during the last major global food crisis, there were 48 moments of significant political violence and political instability as a result of spikes in food prices. Uh, many people are aware of the link between uh, that reality and the emergence of the Arab Spring. Many people are aware of uh, the mass migration and the extreme human suffering and political instability caused by food crisis. And at the end of the day, uh, food and its availability, uh, its quantity and quality are critical to the maintenance of stability around our planet. So my biggest concern, frankly, is that we are just starting a food crisis that is far worse than 2007, 8, and 9. Uh, and that by the time we get to August, September, October, what we all know as the hungry season, and we can go into why it's referred to that way, uh, that we will see the consequences of this food crisis in the terms of political instability, mass migration, famine in certain parts of the world. And, uh, and the only other introductory comment I'd make is, because we've been through this so many times before, we actually know how to prevent the worst consequences and more importantly, we know how to invest in the prevention of these types of crises causing human suffering and political instability around our planet. And yet, crisis after crisis after crisis, we often fail to take those actions. So I look forward to learning from my colleagues here about what works and investing in those efforts in a much more significant way so that our future is not so vulnerable to you know, a war in Ukraine uh, or a drought in East Africa. Claire, your biggest, your biggest concern? I'm worried about the impact of food prices on the uh, momentum that uh, we, were, uh, we were already achieving as a country, but also as a continent. If you look at uh, the, the gains we had made on you know, food security, uh, Rwanda, for example, had attained food security. Uh, millions of people had been taken away from poverty, and we were seeing those gains. 
with the current food prices that we're seeing, you know, recently we saw a 16% increase uh, in food prices in Rwanda. We saw a 121% uh, increase in fertilizers. That's going to impact uh, productivity, productivity. It's going to impact uh, food security. It's going to impact uh, livelihoods because purchasing power is going to be affected in a country that was uh, still addressing issues of poverty. I'm worried about what that means in terms of going back on some of the gains we had made on poverty and, 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 um, and also food security. And so looking at that, uh, and also what it will mean to even undo the, 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 the gains that we'll have lost, I think would be a very difficult challenge. Undoing those gains, yeah. undoing those yeah. gains. Yeah. Hanukkah, mm -hmm. your, your biggest concern. Yeah, I mean, I will echo them. I, I think we have a possibly unimaginable food crisis right in front of us. Um, and when food fails, societies fail, and we all fail. Um, I think the hopeful thing is we know what to do. My biggest concern is will we do it fast enough? So hopefully we'll talk about that. Hopefully, hopefully. Theo? Mm -hmm. yeah, I, w I want to echo what all the other speakers said. What I fear most is that people are looking to the farmers to solve the problem. <laughs> we, we can produce more on less and with less, but we simply don't have the means to do so in the current circumstances. We, the, the, the risk we are exposed to because of climate, because of the, the financial environment, the energy, the prices of our inputs, fertilizers, diesel, agrochemicals, a farmer would now think three times before he makes the investment. So it's not only us who can solve this problem. We need a team and we need it quickly. Right. You can't do it yourself. Yeah. There's a UN suggestion this week that here at the forum that 1.7 billion will face food insecurity this year. A credible Eurasia Group report puts the number higher, 1.9. We're going to take questions from our audience here as we go. And no Slido. It's an intimate enough room. We'll be able to get everybody involved. I'll be able to see you. It'll be my fault if you don't get called on. Um, but, and we're being live streamed. What I'm hearing, though, as a unifying theme here, as concerned as we might be in the news agenda with Ukraine, our organization led this week with the situation at the port in Odessa, getting the harvest out. But what I'm hearing is that prices, pricing, the inflationary context of the inputs, post-COVID, of what people in the street face, that's really what's going to tip us over into that insecurity this year. Maybe, Claire, talk about that from 15 to 20 percent increase. I mean, your government, many governments, must be concerned about civil unrest in a situation like that as we go into that season. What's the feeling out there? For us, uh, as a government, what we're thinking is, uh, I mean, these are challenges that are real and, and they're happening globally. The key thing is to bring all, all the parties together, starting with the people that are going to be affected, those that are going to be paying high prices, those that are already feeling the pain, getting uh, them to understand what's going on and some of the solutions that we have. So I think engaging the people and the public and community and really sharing the truth of what's happening and, and what we have, to, we have to grapple with. I think for us that has been very important. But also trying to intervene as government to get uh, uh, safety nets, uh, social programs that can really support those that, those that have been most affected. That's something that we're doing also as a country and I think that's very important to do that at the, at, at now. But I think um, more importantly is to think about how do you increase local production um, for Rwanda or for Africa. And f in Africa, we always talk about 60% of the world's arable land is in, Af in the African continent, but we're not utilizing it. We're relying on wheat or other products from somewhere. It's a crisis, but how do we learn from this crisis and, and how do we fix some of these problems that we've had? Recently, Rwanda signed an agreement with the World Bank, a $300 million uh, uh, agreement, to try and finance some of these things that we're talking about. How do you uh, de-risk agriculture? How do you support farmers?
And we have everything that it takes in Africa. We just need to put everything together to make it work. I mean, what I hear from Theo is that even where we have land and cultivation, we've got problems on those input prices. Mm -hmm. But I guess there's more land to put into cultivation where that came from, is your point. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but then we cannot waste this crisis and just keep farming the way we've always done. Um, because this crisis is bigger than the Ukraine uh, and ports. This crisis has been building for a long time. Climate change is a big part of it, droughts, floods, um, which means we have to farm differently. And this is a great time to start farming differently. We call it regenerative agriculture. It has to come to many more acres, many more crops, many more regions around the world. And as businesses, we have a responsibility to fund and scale that transition because the farmer cannot do that on his own. And we've got good examples. Um, so I might quote one that's been in place um, between Unilever ADM and the farmers of Iowa for five years now. Soybean farming, you know, we're a big seller of mayonnaise, helmets, soybeans. Soybean farming is not great for the soil, it's very mechanized. So water runs off, the soil deteriorates. So we started with 100 farmers in 2017 to see if we could farm differently to reduce emissions, to reduce water pollution, to improve soil health. Your company We've points funded, out, yeah, yeah, that it takes one to four centuries <laughs> to have soil that's yeah. suitable for this. It all starts with the soil. So we started with 100 farmers. We measured it, University of Iowa measured it, and after five years, we're seeing reduced emissions, less pollution, higher yields. It can be done, um, again, with, of course, leadership of the farmers of Iowa, transitional funding from ADM, from us. We'd love to see more from governments to enable this as well. It can be done. It's not rocket science, but it has to be done on many more crops, many more countries now if we're going to avert this crisis. Raj, you and I met in coverage of politics, and it's mm -hmm. ironic how everything comes back to Iowa in that <laughs> context. But, yes. but, you, pro but you probably, what, what is the role for NGOs and for multinational, for global institutions in this? I mean, we've got a government perspective, we've got a corporate perspective. I think people probably look at the sector and think that, you know, philanthropy isn't big enough to get us through this. Well, philanthropy is certainly not big enough to get us through this. What, what we can do is sort of highlight the path forward and try to lift up and listen to the voices like Claire that basically just gave us the roadmap to, to solve the crisis. And that roadmap has, I, I think, three basic components right now. The first is we need aggressive humanitarian action now, informed by all the science and innovation that we've put into place over 40, 50 years to improve the effectiveness of that humanitarian action. For example, Rockefeller and Grow Intelligence, a data and AI company, launched a, a tool that allows us to visualize vulnerability uh, in terms of this crisis going forward. We know, and we knew before U Ukraine was invaded, we, know, we knew where the hotspots were going to be. Now we know within, with real precision where the hotspots are likely to be in terms of people starving and real political instability from food crises later this year. We can pre-position food, we can get NGOs in there, we can support the World Food Program to have the resources it needs, we can work with local producers and governments to protect people in those communities and reduce the pressures on migration, violence, unrest that may result from real acute hunger later this year. That's number one. Number two is what Claire said, which is we should be investing aggressively in social safety nets. And the truth is, the whole development enterprise, the countries themselves, the World Bank and other similar institutions and NGOs, have learned a lot about how to provide meaningful social protection to communities that are vulnerable. We know how to reach children. We know how to reach pregnant women. We know how to run school feeding programs. We know which of those programs are likely to be most protective at times of crisis. And right now, because countries are facing a fiscal crisis from rising interest payments on debt, mm -hmm. from increased fuel costs, and increased food costs from the prices you just mentioned, they don't have the fiscal capacity to invest in those protection programs when they are needed. We should have a massive global effort. This should be part of a G7. It should be part of a G20. But right now, we need much, much 
bigger push in that area. The final area is, again, what Claire said, is help farmers. We know that helping farmers works to increase local production. Uh, when I was part of the Obama administration, we launched and we've talked about Feed the Future. Mm -hmm. Feed the Future works in Rwanda and 19 other countries. It's no magic. We work with local leaders like Claire and farmers that are represented uh, throughout the country, mostly small scale and me medium sized farmers. And in fact, they have improved their yields, they've improved their production, and the 19 Feed the Future countries are actually more resilient to this crisis because of effectively seven, eight years of real investment. Another example is AGRA, the Alliance for a Green Revolution in mm -hmm. Africa. AGRA has reached, uh, it, it reaches about 11 million farmers in, in about a dozen countries in Africa on an annual basis. About half of those farmers have improved their adoption of fertilizers and inputs like improved seeds, all local, all very sustainably done. And the result has been they've increased their yields from about 1.2 tons per hectare to 2.5 tons per hectare. Mm -hmm. That, I mean, Claire, you tell us, what difference does that make for a family and for a community when you double yields from that low of baseline? I mean, in America, yields are what, 10 tons per hectare? and, and Europe, they're probably eight or nine. Uh, Africa is one of the few places where you still have a lot of farming that's only producing mm -hmm. one or one and a half tons per hectare. So, so we know these efforts work. We know they're incredibly powerful. We need to invest in them more, and we have to use this crisis to actually solve this problem. But it's part of what we did. And I say just we in terms of here we are at the forum. We're trying to get a handle on these issues from sort of 37,000 feet. But in globalizing many of these systems that we're now talking about how that feeds back to the farmer, we also specialized very highly. So Hanukkah, you talk about specialized agriculture in terms of how we grow soy, uh, but we specialized in other ways, that so much fertilizer comes from one country, that so much grain to support subsidized bread comes from another country. Did we over-specialize in terms of the food chain? You know, food security no longer means that any country produces everything it consumes, or the other way around, that it consumes everything it produces. In the modern world, food security means that you need to produce enough of that in which you have a competitive advantage so that you can exchange for that in which you do not have a competitive advantage. You must stick to your guns. You must produce that which you are good at and which your area supports. Um, and, and, and that boils the question down to trade. Right. The trade must flow. Where we are sitting here today, there is still enough food in the world. There, there is enough that we can afford to waste about 30 to 35% of the food that, that leaves a farm gate. And we do. We, 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 we are not sure that it will still be the case in 10 months from now. We, we don't know where the farmers will be able under the current conditions to produce what, what we need. But the, the playing fields must then be leveled. It must be easier to move food and fiber across borders. Um, we cannot allow inputs, agricultural inputs, fertilizers, diesel, um, and food to be used as a weapon of war. We, we must go beyond that. And I know it's, it's an uncomfortable thing and I got criticized for this here in Davos, but I have a bleeding heart for, for the farmers in Russia. You know, they, we cannot create a new humanitarian crisis on that side. And, and somehow, we, we must address the cause of our problem now. The cause is not only this war. We already had sky-high fertilizer prices during COVID. Farmers are still reeling from the impact which COVID had in the dis disruption of their markets. But now, with this war, we, we must simply get it to an end somehow. I was reading Montgomery's autobiography last week, and he says about the Second World War, but this war could have stopped two years earlier, millions less lives lost, if total um, surrender was not the, the goal of it. And and as farmers, we, we are not politicians, we are not scientists, we are not academia. We are looking 
to, to leadership to go there and address this issue and see what we can do to normalize things or else, you know, Martin Suskin, the, 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 the um, German philosopher says, imagine there's a war and nobody goes there. Then it will come to you and you will no longer have the option where to fight it. It will come to your yard, to your veranda, to your kitchen and to your bedroom. I think the, the time has come for, from, from our perspective as farmers to go to the war and, and to try to bring a meaningful end to it. Everybody talk about the consequences of it. But it, it cannot be that hard to get to an amicable solution to the war. Well, Claire, Theo may not be a politician, although that was fairly rousing political speech. <laughs> <laughs> So, I don't know, maybe after the farming thing. Um, but, but Claire, you are a political figure, and if I can say, in a country with very real experience of needing reconciliation from a violent conflict. So how do you respond to this idea that at a certain point, you just need to draw a line under it because one side does not get total victory? Well, I think for us in Rwanda, what we learned from the, the, the genocide against the Tutsis that happened was um, nobody won, everybody lost. Whether you're a victim or perpetrator, or everybody lost. And so in everything that we do, we always think about bringing everybody on the table. And that's why I said engaging even, even those that are suffering you know, from the you know, current food prices. They need to know that there's a problem we're grappling with together. We're not pointing fingers, but we're going to sit together and, and, and knock our heads together to find a solution. But back to your question, oh, did we over-specialize? Uh, I think we did. And I think that Africa lost out in that over-specialization. And Africa has the potential to be part of the solution. And to think about diversifying sources of supplies or sources of inputs. And, and I think for us as, as an African continent, this is the time to really challenge ourselves to rise up to really find or be part of the solutions. And as we think about uh, some of the innovations that are being discussed today, you know, you talked about regenerative agriculture, climate smart agriculture, all these innovations, new seed varieties, who's thinking about those? I think we also want to position ourselves in the African continent as um, being one of those places that you can try these innovations and test them. And Rwanda in particular, we like to position ourselves as a proof of concept country, you know. We don't have all the solutions. You have some of the innovations. Are you looking for a place to test them? Let's test them together. We'll give you a country, we'll give you a place, we'll give you a commitment as a government, and we'll bring the resources that we have together to test and you know, prove those concepts. And if they work very well, let's scale them to the rest for of the world. For knowledge transfer, too, yeah. in order to, to learn more about that. I mean, is that I the multi? Yeah, yeah. I, that. I, I think on the one side, um, you know, it's, it's a pipe dream to think any country on this planet can be food sufficient, self-sufficient. Even the US, which is the most self-sufficient country, is not self-sufficient. <laughs> so trade and borders must stay open if we're gonna feed everyone. That said, in Africa, we have a big opportunity to produce and manufacture more food in Africa for Africa. Um, and we love working um, with Rwanda, where we did a big tea um, collaboration together. We're now working on finger millet, which you may have never heard of, but you know, I had some of that this morning. Yeah, there it's you terrific. go. Yeah. <laughs> there you go. But well, it, we, we eat too many of the same crops. We're working on finger millet in Kenya. Africa can be a real lab, and we've got to do more in Africa for Africa. But is it? Would you say, from a sort of multinational perspective, yeah. is it is it a current reality, or is it more of an aspiration? It's increasingly a reality. So if I look back, even two or three years, we were only doing about 40% of our materials for that we sell in Africa came from Africa. We're now at about 65. So we've really made a step change. And it was, of course, kind of silly. You don't bring eggs from France to sell mayonnaise in Africa. So we don't do that anymore. <laughs> <laughs> um, all right. We must have some questions from our group because I think we've had a few provocative uh, perspectives. So let's, uh, let's start right here in the front. Oh, and we have microphones. We've thought of everything. Hello. Thank you. My name is Adam, and I'm a global shipper from Kotonou in Benin. I would like once again to raise the awareness about the fact that food is now becoming the number one priority when it comes to geopolitics. And regarding to that, having 60% of the arable land 
I would like to know what you think about how us African can, and I'm happy Theo brought it up, can increase or enhance intra-trade among ourselves in order to be self-sufficient and then maybe be the solution for this crisis. Thank you. Can I respond to that? Theo. Often the most beautiful things are born in times of crisis. And with every cell in my body, I hope that this crisis will spark the food production revolution in Africa. Africa has everything which money cannot buy. The land, the water, the climate, the people. What it lacks is things that money can buy. Infrastructure, linkages to markets, mechanization, modernization. We need to commercialize agriculture in Africa. And we, we need to mechanize it and bring the latest technology to the youngsters. Uh, over the last few years, I've seen young people going back to farms when it is profitable. If it is not profitable, they want to run away from it. And the profitability came with digitalization. It came with connectiveness when they could look for markets and see what the market want and find ways to get it there. Nothing makes me more excited about a new generation of young farmers in Africa who are stepping forward and taking control of the, the challenges of competitiveness. If I could add to that, Please. Uh, I think also to increase inter-African trade, I think investments is an, an, an enabler uh, of trade. So to be able to trade within Africa, we need to see more investments within Africa and across Africa. And, and we do already see inter-African trade supporting that. We have investments, for example, um, in a big part from South Africa, from Kenya, uh, from North Africa, Morocco, Egypt, among others. So I think being able to really make it easy uh, to do business within the African continent so we have more investments coming in, those investments will unlock um, into African trade. Who's, who's supposed to lead that investment? Because I'm hearing that it's a technology issue. It's a mechanization, maybe, issue. Is that... Uh, is that a sort of multinational sector? Is that require sort of government or extra governmental coordination? Who's, who's think, supposed to do it? I think it's innovative partnerships. Actually, the, the World Economic Forum has these innovation hubs which enable government, NGOs, business, farmers. It should have started, oops, it should have started with the farmers to get together and come up with these partnerships, because it has to be all of us. It cannot be just a farmer or just a business. Raj? No. It's a, it's a, I think the role of trade certainty in this context is hugely important, because it's very hard to have either domestic investment or foreign direct investment in commercial agriculture. If the if, rules are unclear. If the rules are unclear. And just to put it in perspective, right now as we speak, I think 30 countries have instituted export bans of different commodities during this crisis, compounding the fact that 30% of the world's wheat uh, for trade is, is stuck in Ukraine and 20% of the world's nitrogen for fertilizers is stuck in Russia. And that just makes matters worse. So when the Indian government pulls its wheat off the global market or uh, the Indonesian government pulls its palm oil off the global market, it's exacerbating a crisis. And that those actions, which speak to a, a real domestic fear about will we have food to feed ourselves right now will actually come back and undermine the global system's resilience in six months, 12 months, 18 months. So we have to avoid this, and there needs to be much more of a political agreement to have trade certainty in order to both get through the crisis and to enable more direct investment in agriculture. But Theo, in a way, controversially speaking up for the Russian farmer here, you're saying, look, this these kinds of the, there's harms all around. So, look, we could have had a defense minister join our panel today to talk about the challenge of getting Ukraine's harvest out through uh, Odessa. But I suppose it goes further than that, too, in terms of we talk about not buying Russian gas, Russian oil, but to the degree that we don't buy the harvest from there, is that where, where is, what's the pain point? What, when you're saying you're speaking up for that, incremental farmer in the East. 
What are, what are we doing wrong? They must be able to produce. There must still be food in, 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 in Russia too. Um, we are not going to wish away Russia. A country is not only its political leaders, it's their people too. And it's the biggest profession in Russia. It's the biggest profession in the world. They are more farmers than they are in any other profession. And they are often the poorest. They are often the most food insecure. Russia is not a country of mega farmers and corporate farmers. It's a country also of, of, of smallholders. Um, they are a member of the World Farmers Organization and, and they make valuable contributions in the development of, of, of policies um, in both Europe and in, in Asia. We, we still take medicines there. The USA is still taking medicines there and stuff. So I, I want to plea for food to be able to cross borders um, and, and that we not cause a hunger disaster, um, which later will become a global disaster in any way. It's not their problem. It will be a problem of all of It'll us. It'll be our problem. Richard, I think you were next. Um, and we've got a microphone for you, maybe there. Thank you. To what extent is trade protectionism? So, for example, the classic, you know, French farmers are protected and keep the prices high so you maintain supply of milk or, you know, whatever it is. If those went away in an ideal world, are we a lot better off and how does that happen politically? Repurposing agricultural subsidies is a huge theme um, around the world, and it needs to happen. Still too much of you know, Europe's giant agricultural cap budget goes to practices that are not sustainable. Um, and the EU, to their credit, has, done, uh, has made progress on repurposing subsidies, but it's far from being done. And this is the same in India, and it's the same in the United States and various other markets. So that needs acceleration because otherwise, again, we're creating our own crisis. The cap has yeah. been litigated in this and other forums yeah. since yeah. anyone can remember and since and it predates many of these international organizations. But yeah. you're saying it's still a very present danger to the system. Absolutely, absolutely. Again, progress has been made, but more progress needs to be made. And for example, right now the EU is debating Fit for 55, which is their CO2 reduction target, and all the and what plans they need to do to actually meet that target. It's all about energy. Regenerative agriculture isn't even mentioned. Um, so that needs to change. Regenerative agriculture, carbon capture, and, soil. And repurposing subsidies towards those practices. So it's more, it's too much, you would you'd say it's too much toward mobility and... Well, we need those things too, but if we're going to be net zero, which the U.S. said they will, we need agriculture to play a massive role. Uh, third row, and then we'll come over here. Good morning, everybody. My name is Khadim al -Diray. I am the chairman of al -Dahra Agriculture based in Abu Dhabi. Um, what I hear today like what we heard in 2008. And actually, in UAE, in 2006, we have uh, felt the pressure of the importance of the food security stability. And we are in the region in the Middle East where we don't have enough water and we don't have uh, fert uh, fertilized land. So what we have decided we have decided to, to outsource the, uh, the product from the globe. And we have shortlisted many countries. And that shortlisting based on water availability, investment uh, encouragement, and accessibility. What we have seen since then, three major factors that really affecting the food security. One is availability which is not the case this year. The other one, accessibility, which is more or less was since the pandemic. And the third one, affordability, which is extremely the case nowadays. I think affordability too, not to interrupt, but that's what led our process up here. You're putting those other two maybe ahead. 
Yes, but no, today the affordability is the issue, the case. Many countries today, um, they don't have, and we, this is the, the challenge that is coming, mainly if you uh, look at uh, Sri Lanka, uh, Egypt, and other countries and African countries, they are suffering, and there is less of credit um, facilities uh, to, uh, uh, to afford or to provide for such uh, uh, hikes and commodities. Now, when this crisis happens, we see a lot of government intervention, a lot of the thought and discussion. But what we have done in UAE, the government has taken a firm decision, long-term commitment. And they have asked the private sector to look at opportunities where and how they can mitigate that risk not to happen every year. Every single country, either rich or poor, they have a budget to buy that products. But if they have allocated and used that money wisely by vertically integrating or creating sort of in-kind investment in the countries where they are friendly or they are neighboring, and they focus their effort to produce and to create solutions, sustainable solutions, this would have not solved the problem, but probably it will eliminate when the crisis happen. Now, you know, nobody doubts Black Sea um, is the main source of grains. Russia, Ukraine, Romania, and this part of the world, uh, beside the west, uh, uh, the w uh, west part of Europe. No one has thought this problem would happen, and this net availability. I cannot blame the farmers. The farmers are actually the more victims than anybody else. Well, because they have, yeah. Yeah, yeah, but they have put money and they are suffering. They are suffering from the energy uh, input cost, energy fertilizer, but also now they don't have the, the room to sell. And even they don't have the access to the cash to, uh, to harvest or uh, to buy fertilizer. So they are in big trouble. Consumers, they are really cannot afford today uh, what uh, uh, the price. So who to be blamed? Well, so is your question who to blame? What, what's your question for the panel? Actually, then, my question, we, I want to come my, up my question, yeah. it is the responsibility on the government to really know exactly how they can mitigate the risk. Because the problem happens when there are some countries, they ban the export, so they must be responsible. Knowing that let me, let me ask it in this way, and then I, I, I want to get to our next uh, question here. Maybe, it, maybe the question is, governments try to mitigate risks to a degree. Sometimes those are beyond their capability. So, for instance, we talk, I think, in an individual European government context about how the consumer will deal with inflation. I mean, at a certain point, if you're facing a global inflation situation, there's only limited levers to pull. What, what are the levers that, to uh, our friend's point, should have been pulled? I mean, if, there, if we can do a little bit of hindsight here, what do we miss? I can name one. Yeah. Uh, you know, we just are emerging from, in some parts of the world, not fully emerging from a global pandemic that's been obviously a multi-year crisis. Through that pandemic, wealthier nations pulled the lever of fiscal stimulus and often targeted uh, social protection in the context of fiscal stimulus. In fact, those countries put between 25 and 30 percent of GDP into an effort to sustain the economy through the crisis. Developing countries did about 2 percent of GDP, and emerging economies did about 6 percent of GDP, so larger emerging economies. So, there, we're already, the lever that they need to pull, that they're not able to pull, is basically public investment in immediate social protection. Like everybody took care of their own. Everyone took care of their own. And then these countries, and on top of that, we now have a global inflation problem that is causing interest rates to go up appropriately. But the, it's the developing and emerging economies that have the by far the greatest multiple of interest rate increases and therefore even more debt sustainability burdens. 
of the developing countries in the world are facing immediate debt sustainability crises at a time when they're also facing a food and fuel crisis. So they're missing the lever of social protection, which everyone else in the world used to get their populations through a crisis. And, we, and that's a solvable problem, but it takes global cooperation and more money. Let's get here in the second row while we've still got a bit of time. Your question. Thank you. My name is Evgenia. I'm from Ukraine. I'm Global Shaper. Uh, I would like to put it this way. I'm really surprised how the discussion is going on here, because especially on the question of whom to blame, because we have an answer to whom blame, because Ukraine is not the country who, whom we should blame for that, right? Russia is invaded Ukraine. She is blocking Russia. Uh, Odess and Black Sea, uh, but also I'm really surprised how we are putting uh, the question of whether Russia will be on hunger. Believe me, Russia won't be on hunger. There is already an evidence that Russia is stealing the gain in the amount preliminary, according to the Ukrainian Defense Ministry, of 400,000 uh, tons of gain. So and translate it and transport it to the Syrian. You, so you mean sending east what we're not seeing coming out of the port or sending west? So, say again? You're, you're saying sending that harvest east that east. we're not seeing East, we out. are not seeing it. It's already on CNN. We already have a satellite proof that Russians shipping from Sevastopol. As the, the Crimea itself doesn't have um, the capacity to make an agriculture in that uh, big amount. So basically, that's the harvest that was stealing in Ukraine. So the case is we have uh, 2 uh, million tons uh, of gain now uh, in Ukraine, saved in Ukraine. But we need to burn it. We will need to burn it if we will not to have deliver it somewhere, yeah. right? Yeah. So don't you think that this discussion should go in a way how we can help Ukraine to deliver it to Africa, to Asia, to Europe, to any other country, rather than saying who we should blame, because we already have an answer for that, and saying whether the Russia will be on hunger. Thank you. Yeah, no, I think you're absolutely right. And food is being used as a weapon of war here, which the UN has condemned, and we know by who. Um, I, I, I think you're absolutely right. We, we, in partnership, need to do whatever we can to create corridors to get the crops out of the Ukraine. Um, and hopefully there will be some sea corridors, but in the meantime, we need land corridors on steroids. Um, and the EU did actually a good job during COVID to create these green lanes for food um, when borders were closed. We need something similar urgently to get more land transport out of Ukraine. I think, I think, too, what, what's being pointed out is the trade point, that that harvest getting out of those silos, getting shipped to customers which Ukraine has developed, that's trade. And maybe the alternative to trade is just theft, is that it's just, mm -hmm. you know, yeah. sent back east. Look, the Ukrainian yeah. farmers are, are very resilient. They, they, they are tough. I visited Hungary about a month ago, and I asked whether there would be any possibility to meet with Ukrainian farmers. Now, it was not possible. The men are not allowed to come across the border, but I, I met with their families, with their wives, and they are planting. They put on bulletproof vests, and they are planting. They are planting for a harvest in the western part of Ukraine for, for 30 million tons. And it struck me how tragic the situation of a farmer is in a war. They are always the last to leave because somebody needs to feed the, the livestock and give water to them. Somebody needs to do the irrigation. They, they always hang on there too long. But it anchors a lot of stability in, in that region. In Ukraine itself, we do not get the messages from the farmers who say, but, but, but we are running out of the means to produce. We are running out of food ourselves. Um, the, 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 the crisis with the Ukrainian farmers is that they, they cannot get their products out now and they cannot get the, the money for, for, for their products. So they cannot afford to buy. Um, I know that a number of the big corporations, Unilever, last um, yesterday we met with some of the captains of industry in the fertilizer and the seed 
businesses. We, we say that th they are sending, the, the one company sent 200 trucks of seed into the Ukraine so that they can, can go on to plant. Um, and this is why I tried to put the, the, the light on the plight of those Russian farmers. Because one of these days the war will be yeah. over and then <laughs> we need to have a foundation from which to build again. We're going to have to close this out, but just to send us home, Claire, uh, you've got an announcement today uh, coordinated with the World Economic Forum and maybe uh, send us home with uh, what you've agreed today. Yeah. Thank you, David. I, I think what we've heard today, you know, from, from Raj, from Haneke, from uh, even uh, the farmers, is collaboration and partnership is extremely important. We need platforms where collaboration and partnerships can, 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 can happen to find solutions. This is where I'm very excited about the, the new partnership that we have with the World Economic Forum, with industries such as Rubberbank, which is a food action alliance, a platform that we'll be hosting in Rwanda and, and co-leading uh, in Rwanda. And that's where we hope to really tackle these issues. How do we achieve uh, all these solutions that we want? How do we address um, uh, climate issues? How do we address uh, you know, farmers and livelihoods? How do we bring better prices to farmers? All these issues that need to be addressed. It's an important platform, and I'm really looking forward to the Food Action Alliance that will be responding to this. Thank you. Uh, thanks to everyone on the panel. Thanks to everyone participating in the room. Good luck.